Small hepatitis is defined as acute inflammation of the liver, which is caused by a number of different viruses. The most important causes are hepatitis A and hepatitis B, which are distinct both epidemiologically and immunologically. But a number of other viruses are implicated in hepatitis. For example, yellow fever, cytomegalovirus, EB virus, and rubella virus. However, we are going to consider only hepatitis A and hepatitis B. There's an impression that uh, viral hepatitis is a new disease. In fact, it is not. It was described uh, in the Bible. The jaundice was uh, mentioned by Hippocrates. But the first statistical records of uh, jaundice were kept in London in the year 1665. And if we look for a moment at the bills of mortality, you will notice that in the year 1665, 21 people were executed, uh, 86 died from French pox, 23 died from fright, uh, surprisingly only 9 were murdered, and the figure that interests me in particular are the 110 uh, cases which died uh, from jaundice. Of course, this does not necessarily imply that the cause of death was viral hepatitis, but I think it is important uh, to appreciate the fact that Jaundice as a disease entity has been recognized for many years. Now, I should like to briefly consider the, clin the clinical picture of viral hepatitis. And you will notice that the clinical spectrum ranges from the asymptomatic illness to an illness without jaundice to the typical uh, syndrome with jaundice, which may indeed progress to death. In addition, uh, viral hepatitis may result in chronic liver disease, such as chronic active hepatitis, uh, cirrhosis, and possibly primary carcinoma of the liver. As far as uh, the prevalence of these infections uh, is concerned, we base most of the information on notification rates. And if we uh, now look at the notification rates in the United States uh, since the year 1966, you'll notice that as far as uh, infectious hepatitis or hepatitis A, this remains as an important endemic disease. But an almost dramatic increase in the prevalence of hepatitis B has taken place since 1966. Now, a variety of uh, reasons have been put forward to try and explain this uh, increase in prevalence. For example, uh, the problem of narcotic drug addiction, the increasing use of uh, sophisticated uh, surgical and uh, medical um, procedures which involve more uh, the use of more and more blood, the introduction of uh, hemodialysis units, and so on. But the precise reason for this increase in uh, type B hepatitis is not known. All that one could say at this stage is that there is no doubt about it, that throughout the world, the prevalence of hepatitis B is increasing. I should now like to consider uh, how hepatitis B is transmitted. Without doubt, the most important uh, route remains the parental route. In other words, uh, contamination of uh, surgical instruments and other implements which are used uh, both in medical and non-medical practice, contamination with blood and blood products or tissue fluid, either from a carrier or from a patient incubating the disease or convalescing from the disease. Another way by which uh, the infection may be spread, of course, is by such procedures as tattooing and scarification. And of course, in tropical countries, uh, passive transmission by uh, blood-sucking insects is a distinct possibility. The suggestion that uh, mosquitoes, for example, may act as biological vectors has not uh, so far been confirmed. Now, 
an important mode of transmission of hepatitis B, particularly in the large metropolitan areas of the world, of course, is through the use of syringes and needles uh, by drug addicts. And of course, they would spread uh, the infection amongst themselves and also to their immediate contact. More recently, evidence has been forthcoming that, prolong that intimate contact uh, may uh, result in the transmission of uh, hepatitis B. And I don't really think that I have to go into great details on how uh, this spread uh, could be achieved. So that we have a variety of methods which uh, allow the spread of hepatitis B uh, within the community. The real advances that have taken uh, place in our knowledge of hepatitis B relate, of course, to the discovery of Australia antigen. Now, Australia antigen was first uh, described by a geneticist, Dr. Bloomberg from Philadelphia, who was interested in uh, beta lipoprotein polymorphic traits. And he argued that because lipoproteins are poor antigens, that antibodies will not be readily formed against this antigen. And he considered that multiply transfused individuals, such as hemophiliacs, may have antibody to lipoproteins. And he used uh, the simple two-dimensional gel diffusion technique in order to detect this uh, lipoprotein. So that the antiserum was placed in the center of the well and the sera under test in the periphery. And he collected uh, blood from uh, populations from all over the world. And during the testing of such samples, he obtained a precipitin line, such as is shown here, uh, with a serum obtained from an aborigine, and hence the term Australia antigen, because the antigen did not behave like a typical lipoprotein. But the association between Australia antigen and hepatitis B did not become apparent for a number of years. Now in 1969, using essentially a similar technique, namely the interaction of antigen and antibody, we mixed the antiserum with serum containing Australia antigen and examined it under the electron microscope by the technique of negative staining. And other, under the electron microscope, the picture which emerged is extremely interesting, namely a remarkably pleomorphic uh, picture consisting of small spherical 20 nanometer particles, tubular forms of all shapes and sizes, and large double-shelled 42 nanometer particles, which are double-shelled and are now referred to as the Dane particles. And we will consider these uh, in due course as the candidates for being hepatitis B virus. The discovery, therefore, of Australia antigen, or as it is referred to now, hepatitis B antigen, has set in motion a whole series of tests for detecting an antigen which is specifically associated uh, with hepatitis B infection. So that we have a variety of techniques which now may be used for detecting the antigen. An example of uh, the test which is most widely used at the moment is the technique of counter-immunoelectrophoresis, whereby an electrical force is used to drive the antigen and the antibody together and you get clear precipitin lines, usually within two hours, so that the technique is rapid and uh, results, uh, for example, on uh, screening blood, may be obtained within a relatively short period of time. However, uh, the sensitivity of the techniques is clearly an important factor uh, in considering the suitability of a test for routine screening or indeed for diagnostic purposes. So that we have, uh, over a period of time, 
a series of tests which have developed. And if we consider immunodiffusion, which is the first technique to be uh, described, as uh, a method which we know now to be the least sensitive and give it a unit of one, electrophoresis is only 10 times uh, more sensitive and complement fixation is only 20 times more sensitive. However, uh, latex particle agglutination is considerably more sensitive, as you can see, but suffers from the disadvantage that a number of nonspecific uh, reactions may be obtained with it. But the technique of uh, latex particle agglutination has more or less led to the introduction of second generation tests uh, which involve the coating of particles, be, be they uh, inert particles such as latex or red cells, uh, which could be used for testing for hepatitis B antigen. So we are now going to move into the more sensitive second generation techniques. And the first uh, method that I should like to discuss is uh, hemagglutination. Now, there are two types of hemagglutination which uh, have been used in hepatitis. Hemagglutination inhibition, or passive hemagglutination inhibition, and as you can see, the sensitivity uh, is not very great. But more recently, a different technique has been used, referred to as reverse passive hemagglutination, which promises to be a most sensitive technique. And here we see uh, the test being set up. The diluent is first added to a microtita plate. And this is followed by the addition of the serum under test. Now, uh, red cells, which had been coated with purified and specific hepatitis B antibody, are added to each well, and the plate is allowed to incubate for a short while in order to allow the red cells to settle down. After incubation, the patterns are red and a negative result is shown by the formation of a clear button of red cells, whereas a positive reaction is shown as in the form of a pattern. The sensitivity of reverse passive hemagglutination is still being evaluated. The next technique that I should like to discuss is radioimmunoassay, or to be more precise, the sandwich type radioimmunoassay technique which combines the sensitivity of radioastrope detection with the specificity of antigen-antibody interaction. The technique is relatively simple to carry out. And as you can see, the first stage consists in the addition of serum under test into test tubes which had been coated with antibody to hepatitis B antigen. After incubation, the excess serum is washed out of each tube before the next step. Specific hepatitis B antibody which had been labeled with radioactive iodine-125 is now added into each tube and the tubes allowed to incubate for a, a further period of time. The excess radioactive tracer is washed and following the washing procedure, the tubes are counted. The technique has now been semi-automated so that counting of the tubes in a gamma well type counter 
can be carried out uh, with many tubes overnight. Radio immunoassay is therefore the most sensitive technique that we have to date for detecting hepatitis B antigen and indeed hepatitis B antibody. Electron microscopy, of course, is a sensitive technique, but clearly not practical for routine diagnostic uh, procedures. Still on the electron microscope, I should now like to show you yet another type of particle, and that is the so-called inner core. If we examine for a moment this micrograph, you'll notice that once more we have this pleomorphic picture consisting of the small spherical particles, the tubular forms, the double-shelled particles, and here, marked with an arrow number four, shows yet another class of particle that is a double-shelled particle which is undergoing spontaneous uncoating to reveal the inner core which we believe may be the nuclear capsid of hepatitis B virus. My colleague, uh, Dr. June Almeida, has stripped the outer coat of the Dane particle using a detergent. And the micrograph that she obtained is shown uh, as follows. And here we see that we have a uniform picture of distinct spherical virus-like particles measuring approximately 27 nanometers in diameter. And more interesting, the addition of antibody from patients convalescing from hepatitis reveals specific bridging between the particles by gamma globulin uh, molecules. The cores have since been visualized by thin section electron microscopy in liver cells obtained by biopsy from carriers of hepatitis B virus. In addition, cultured human embryo liver cells have been inoculated with known infective material and the cores had been localized using the immunofluorescent antibody technique. In this preparation, which is the control, no specific fluorescence can be seen. Whereas, in inoculated cells, the cores are clearly uh, localized by immunofluorescence within the nuclei of the hepatocytes. Whereas, hepatitis B antigen, or the coat antigen, is localized in the cytoplasm of the liver cells. So that the picture which is now emerging is one of considerable antigenic complexity. And here we see hepatitis B virus, which is the 42 nanometer particle. And we have a dichotomy into the nuclear capsid or the core which produces its own antibody. And the second antigen antibody system, which consists of the protein coat, or hepatitis B antigen, that is to say, the small spherical particles and the tubules. And these particles display a complex antigenic surface activity consisting of different subtypes, which have been given a different uh, nomenclature consisting of a group-specific antigen referred to as A, and D and Y, which are mutually exclusive, and W and R, which in general are mutually exclusive. So that we have a number of sets of hepatitis B antigen, which have displayed a remarkable geographical distribution. And these antigens produce specific antibody, or hepatitis B antibody. Now I should like to move on and illustrate 
the laboratory findings by a practical example. And the example that uh, I have chosen is the problem of hepatitis in hemodialysis units. Here we see uh, the problem in a form of a summary. You'll notice that a significant number of patients on maintenance hemodialysis suffer from hepatitis. And the mortality can be remarkably high. For example, in 1966, 28% of the patients died. The incidence of hepatitis in dialysis units is also shown by the number of cases reported from different centers uh, between 1966 and 1970. In fact, 80% of dialysis units have reported cases of hepatitis up to 1970. And you'll notice again that not only a large number of patients are involved, but a significant proportion of staff as well. We have to consider, in particular, the problem of staff. And it is of interest that it is members of staff which are in closest contact with the patient which stand a greater risk of developing hepatitis. For example, the nurse, followed by the dialysis technician, and finally the physician. Why do we have this problem of hepatitis in dialysis units? How is the infection introduced? Well, first of all, of course, by blood. Secondly, we have the problem of the anecteric patient, or indeed the carrier. There is also the possibility of the transplant of a kidney to a patient from hepatitis B carrier. In addition, there is the problem of the spread to patients from unit staff, although this has not been shown to be a problem uh, as far as we know. And then there is the non-parenteral spread, which again contributes to this high prevalence of hepatitis in dialysis units. And once the infection is in the unit, then of course it tends to be maintained. And the reasons, of course, are quite obvious. First of all, there is the problem of repeated exposure, the fact that sterilization of the complex equipment is difficult, the fact that patients have to share dialyzers, and once more, the difficulty of non-parenteral spread of hepatitis B. How can we control the problem of hepatitis in dialysis units? Most important would be regular screening of patients and staff by a sensitive technique, as I illustrated before. Secondly, and again, a most important measure is to limit the amount of blood which is used in dialysis units. And clearly, of course, all blood must be tested for the presence of hepatitis B antigen. And most important, of course, is the exercise of strict cross-infection control. The provision of individual dialyzers is clearly not a practical one. And the use of specific hepatitis B immunoglobulin is under trial at the moment. What do we do? with the carriers. Well, of course, a patient who is a carrier of hepatitis B antigen may be segregated at home or alternatively sent for treatment to isolation units. There are two problems which are involved. If the patient is on home dialysis, the infection may be spread to home contacts. On the other hand, the staffing of isolation units can be problematic. And at the present time, carriers of hepatitis B antigen who require dialysis are dialyzed at home. Advances in hepatitis, of course, continue to be made. And during the next program, I should like to discuss the prospects for vaccines against hepatitis.
Scientific basis of medicine, hepatitis antigen, C296 stroke 2. One of the apparently insoluble problems in hepatitis is the cultivation of the responsible agents. And despite efforts over many years to cultivate hepatitis A and hepatitis B virus, no uh, reproducible or consistent system of replicating these agents has so far been described. I've already discussed uh, methods of inoculating monolayers of human embryo liver cells and the detection of hepatitis B antigen, both the core and the outer coat, in inoculated cultures by the immunofluorescent technique. But these uh, effects are non-cytocidal. In order to try and propagate hepatitis B virus, the technique that we are currently using is organ culture of human embryo liver. A number of uh, sera which had been inoculated into such preparations have led to the production of uh, antigen, but we have been unable to successfully passage it more than once. The problem, therefore, of finding a way of uh, propagating this agent seems to be, for the time being, as elusive as ever. Now, it, it may be possible that some of the difficulties which we are experiencing are related to the conditions of the culture. Because so far, we've only uh, been successful in maintaining cultures for up to 10 days. The antigen, which is a marker of hepatitis B virus, has been localized in cells of the organ culture by thin section electron microscopy. And furthermore, the antigen has been localized in the cells by immunofluorescence. It may well be that the conditions of the culture are not yet ideal. Equally, it may be that we require some other types of organ culture of the liver before reproducible and consistent replication of hepatitis B virus has been achieved. I have already alluded to the global problem of hepatitis. For example, the carrier rate of hepatitis B antigen in the normal blood donor population in, in this country is approximately 1 in 600 to 1 in 1,000, whereas in certain uh, tropical areas of the world, as many as 20% of the apparently healthy population may be carrying the antigen. This is in addition to uh, the problem, the clinical problem, uh, caused by hepatitis B virus. So let us refer back now to an electron micrograph of, the, of hepatitis B virus. And once more, uh, point out the complexity of the picture and refer to the Dane particle, which we believe now to be a hepatitis B virus. And once more, if we consider uh, the structural complexity of the virus, we, uh, you will recall the dichotomy, which uh, consists of the nucleocapsid and the core antibody. And then we have uh, hepatitis B antigen, the, prote the protein coat. So in the first instance, let's consider the core antibody. Now, core antibodies do not signal recovery from infection. 
nor do they correlate with resistance to infection. And the core antibodies are not boosted by re-exposure re to antigen. And furthermore, and this may appear paradoxical, core antibodies are present in all chronic antigen carriers that have been tested to date. What, therefore, are the properties of the coat antigen or hepatitis B antigen? It is a protein with a varying amount of lipid. This is, after all, the way by which it was discovered by Dr. Bloomberg. It has the electrophoretic mobility of an alpha-2 globulin, and more recently, DNA polymerase activity associated with the core has been discovered. The word hepatitis B vaccine had been banded about for some time now, and most of the work towards a vaccine was initiated by Dr. Krugman and his colleagues at the Willowbrook State School. This is a large institution uh, in New York State, and two types of hepatitis have been found to be prevalent in that institution. Hepatitis A, which has been referred to as MS1, and hepatitis B, which is referred to as MS2. It has now been shown that MS2 serum is infective and transmission experiments to 25 children have shown that all the children acquired the antigen, all the children had evidence of liver damage as shown by abnormal transaminase activity. And furthermore, 37.5% of the children remained as carriers. The next uh, phase of the studies, hepatitis B immunoglobulin was administered to the children shortly after the infective serum. Ten volunteers participated in that study, and it was found that 40% of the recipients acquired the antigen, and 40% developed evidence of liver damage as judged by abnormal transaminase activity, and 20% remained as carriers. Now, as far as the vaccine is concerned, this consisted of heated whole serum containing MS2. 29 children took part in this study, and 41 acquired the antigen, and a smaller proportion developed evidence of liver damage, and only 10 remained as carriers. Now, I don't consider that heated whole serum can be regarded as a satisfactory vaccine, and I think that one ought to look at these results somewhat more critically. Heat-inactivated MS2 serum was administered to 29 children, and four to eight months later, they were challenged with the original known infective material. Hepatitis was prevented in 69%. Generally mild hepatitis occurred in 31% of the children, and 3% developed frank jaundice. As far as the laboratory findings are concerned, the antigen was detected in 41% of the children. Abnormal liver function tests also in 41% of the children. And in terms of the acquisition of hepatitis B antibody, transient antibody was detected in 21%, and in only 7% did the antigen persist longer than four to eight months. And then finally, in terms of the persistence of the antigen, this has been substantially reduced to 10%. However, it is unlikely that heated whole serum would be acceptable as a vaccine against hepatitis. What other approaches could be made towards developing a vaccine? Let us consider again the nature of the antigen. It is virus-coded material, 
probably excess coat protein. But there are a number of other alternatives. It could consist of host-coded material synthesized after infection or virus-coded and host-coded material. And there's the fourth possibility that it may consist almost entirely of normal host-coded material which is uh, produced as a result of infection. The most likely explanation, however, is that hepatitis B antigen is excess viral coat protein. If this is so, then another approach towards the development of a vaccine is feasible. And that is using the principle of active immunization. It is known that viral coat protein challenges the immune mechanism of the body in precisely the same way as the entire infectious agent. Therefore, the viral coat protein could be separated and if active subunits were found, for example, polypeptides, then these could be attached onto a macromolecular carrier and used for active immunization. One of the problems that has been recognized is the close association of hepatitis B antigen with normal serum components. And this has been an acknowledged difficulty in separating the antigen in pure form from serum. We have applied the technique of isoelectric focusing in a sucrose density gradient containing carrier amphalites for separation of the antigen. Hepatitis B antigen was found to separate into two discrete bands. Aliquots from these bands were then solubilized and subjected to electrophoresis in 10% SDS polyacrylamide gels. After staining, eight polypeptides were identified. Coupled with prior separation by isoelectric focusing, this procedure allows fine resolution of the constituent polypeptides, at least one of which is in the molecular weight range of 80,000 to 100,000. Such polypeptides are being now investigated as potential vaccines against hepatitis B by defining the immunogenic moiety by studies in appropriately selected non-human primates such as chimpanzees. While still on the subject of monkeys, I should now like to go on to the recent advances with hepatitis A. And these stem from the work of Dr. Deinhardt with marmosets, which are species of small South American monkeys. In 1967, it was shown that marmosets are susceptible to human hepatitis A, but the subject has been somewhat controversial. But recently, independent confirmation has come from other laboratories showing that at least three species of marmosets are susceptible to human hepatitis A, Seguinus mystax, nigricolis, and fusicicolis, in that order of sensitivity. More recent studies in Costa Rica have led to the identification using the Marmoset model of an agent which is referred to as CR326. And the properties of this virus are as follows. It measures 25 to 50 nanometers by filtration. It is ether stable, it is acid stable, and it is heat resistant for one hour at 60 degrees centigrade. Using again the Marmoset model, CR326 was neutralized by convalescent hepatitis A serum, but not by convalescent human hepatitis B serum. And more important, Marmosets receiving neutralized virus, that is to say the agent plus the antiserum, remain susceptible to challenge to CR326, which is good evidence that the agent which has been passaged in marmosets is indeed a human hepatitis A virus. Other studies have recently 
been published from the United States, where using the technique of immune electron microscopy, virus-like particles were identified in fecal filtrates. Using a similar technique and a somewhat more modest effort in our laboratories, we have now identified virus-like particles which differ morphologically from the particles identified in the United States. And these are shown in this slide. Here we have a virus-like particle which is uncoiling to reveal an inner core. And if I'm allowed to speculate, by analogy to hepatitis B, we have a structure which is not dissimilar. And once more, if we return to the electron microscope, we have now identified further uh, particles which measure approximately 30 nanometers in diameter, and they appear to have a double shell. And yet another micrograph will show the appearance of these particles after purification on cesium chloride. And now we see that we are dealing with regular virus-like particles, uh, which seem to be consistent in size. And these, again, measure 30 to 32 nanometers in diameter. And the most recent studies we have used the technique of immune electron microscopy, adding an antiserum kindly provided by Dr. Cross, which he prepared in rabbits against the fecal antigen identified in Australia in 1970. And under the electron microscope, we now have an interesting picture of these very same particles that we have isolated from uh, patients with type A hepatitis, and these are ringed, as you can see, with antibody. So that we seem to have a specific reaction between these virus-like particles and the antiserum which had been raised in rabbits. So advances in viral hepatitis A are now being made, and one would hope that within a short period of time, specific serological tests will be available for this form of hepatitis and ultimately this should lead to development of vaccines against hepatitis A as well.